Uh, good morning, uh, a good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and distinguished guests. Uh, I'm currently the uh, director of the senior project group uh, for the education re research in medical AI, which is called SNU AI Med for short. Uh, SNU AI Med is a university wide consortium led by SNU College of Medicine. The university formed a consortium uh, with the College of Engineering, a Graduate School of Data Science, SNU Hospital, SNU Bundang Hospital, and several industrial partners. On behalf of SNU AI Med, I would like to express our gratitude to the Ministry of Education and Ministry of Health and Welfare for their financial support. Now, I am delighted to welcome you all to the third seminar of 2023 SNU AI Maths seminar series. Today, uh, we have a special speaker joining us from AI plus health. He will uh, deliver a lecture on the impact of AI on various industries, particularly in healthcare. His talk will shed light on how AI is revolutionizing these sectors and discuss how people can adapt to this rapidly changing landscape. Let me provide some background information about our esteemed speaker, uh, Eric Chang. He is an advisor and founder of startups in AI plus health space. Previously, he held the position of Partner Director of Technology Strategy at Microsoft Research Asia. In this role, he was responsible for IP portfolio management, initiating research themes, and guiding technology to make a real-world impact. His career spans various uh, significant contributions in the field of AI. In 2003, Eric Chang co-founded the Microsoft Advanced Technology Center, leading teams in development of Office, Windows, and other Microsoft products. He also initiated a multidisciplinary incubation team, fostering innovation within the company. Prior to his work at Microsoft Research, he was one of the founding members of research group at Nuance Communications, a pioneering company in natural speech interface technology. During his time in Nuance, he played a crucial role in the development of the world's first deployed Japanese uh, natural language speech uh, recognition system. His academic background is equally imp impressive. He holds PhD mas and master's and bachelor's degrees all in the field of electrical engineering and computer science from MIT. Additionally, he has published extensively in the field of e-health, speech processing, and machine learning, and is the author of uh, over 15 granted and pending patents. Without further ado, I invite Dr. Eric Chang to the stage to deliver his captivating lecture. Thank you very much. Please have warm applause, please. Uh, thanks again for the kind introduction. It's my great honor and pleasure to be here today to talk about uh, how AI impact industries and how should people adapt. So um, first, how many people here in the audience recognize this image? Raise your hand. Do you know what this image is? Okay. This image was very famous uh, because it's actually the first AI-generated image that's known to have actually won an art show award. So it was basically in, back in the summer last year when someone actually submitted in this into a state fair, uh, state fair art show and then uh, basically uh, won, right? So, so it's actually sort of surprised a lot of people on how well AI can actually do in terms of these kind of uh, creative tasks now. So uh, today I'm going to talk about AI, right? So before I do that, now I just want to get a sense of the audience. So raise your hand if you have used either ChatGPT or your stable diffusion or any other so new AI apps? Raise your hand if you have actually used it, okay? So raise your hand if you actually have used ChatGPT+. Are you actually 
paid and actually use ChatGPT Plus. Okay, okay, a few people. Okay, great. Okay, so so that's great. So so you are very much aware of what AI can do. So next one is raise your hand if you are excited about the emergence of AI. Raise your hand. Uh, okay, about thirty percent. Okay, and then another one. Raise your hand if you're worried about the emergence of AI. Oh, actually more, okay, that's, that's interesting. Okay, so, so actually more people worried and excited about AI. That's, that's interesting, okay. Yeah, so I think it's actually perfectly normal for people to be both excited and worried, actually. I mean, if you, especially if you talk to people who are actually working on AI today, and most of them are very, very excited, but also very worried as well. So, uh, so I'm certainly count myself in that camp, in that I'm both very excited and also I'm uh, worried, maybe not very worried, but slightly worried about how people might use AI. Right, so today I'm going to talk about how can AI be impacting different industries, right? So before I do that, I would do like a very quick introduction of what AI can do today, right? Because I think a lot of people, they read about AI, but maybe um, I've been working on AI since 1980s, right? I, I started doing neural nets when it was 1987, 86. So, so to me, you know, this emergence of AI has been a long, long journey, right? But a lot of people sort of just out of nowhere came in a chat GPT, right? So just give, give people a sense of the perspective. And then I'll talk about the potential impact of AI. And then lastly, I'll talk about the opportunities and challenge for people in this new era of AI. So uh, the latest excitement has been about generative AI. So the idea of generative AI is that you can give an AI system like ChatGPT some prompt, and then you will actually be able to generate either text Right, you can actually help you write a memo or email, or you can actually you know, generate like a new document, or, or you can also generate images as well, like I show, right, with Midjourney. You can also generate audio, I and mean, people have used it to compose music, or to uh, create like uh, synthetic voices, right, or video, and a lot of people are now using it to write programming code, right? And then also, of course, it does a very good job at doing a translation. So here are some examples of generative AI, right? So, so on the left, you can see the example using stable diffusion. So in this case, the user can just sketch and say, I want a dog with roughly this outline as an image, right? And then stable diffusion, you can actually ask the stable diffusion to give you five different choices of you know, what kind of dog might fit into that general outline and it looks like a dog, right? So you can see that these are all very high quality, right? And then on the right, it's actually, um, Google released, or at least announced, that they have a system that can generate music from text description. So you can say, oh, I want some jazz music, or I want to classical symphony, or things like that. But just to show how fast the field is moving now, this was back in January, and at that time they only showed it, or announced it, but they didn't allow people to try it. But now they actually opened up. So now if you go to Google's website, you can actually try this for yourself, right? Because there's so much competition with AI nowadays that they feel they must release this, right? And then so, so if you look at large launch model, which is basically where a lot of new progress has been made, it's actually has a long history. So uh, large launch model is also, or language model in general had been started in the 60s and 70s. And then you can use it to, uh, for, for example, for doing uh, for speech recognition to improve speech recognition accuracy. And on the bottom, CA stands for conversa conversational agents, right? So conversation agent, I mean, the earliest work was uh, by Professor Weizenbaum at MIT back in 1966. They had a program called ELISA. So ELISA is basically a, a chatbot like you can ask, like, and, and so treat it as a psych psychiatrist, right? So you can say, Eliza, I'm very sad today. And then they would say, oh, okay, well, so uh, tell me about uh, why you are sad, right? So, so it wasn't very smart, but you basically just converted your sentence back a, a, into another sentence, a, a question for you. But then it keeps the conversation going, right? And it was helping people really to do that. And then later on, of course, there's uh, the uh, Apple Siri, which is much more uh, capable than Eliza, and then also the Amazon Alexa, right? And then, of course, the, the latest the exciting part was actually uh, GPT-4. So uh, March 14 is actually a very interesting day. So um, March 14, they, they, in, in the U.S., they call it Pi Day, right? Pi is 3.14159, da, 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 right? So March 14 is a Pi Day. 
And it's, it's at least interesting to MIT students because uh, if you apply to MIT as undergrad, they announce whether you get into MIT or not on Pi Day. They send out the email on Pi Day, okay? And then OpenAI, for some reason, I don't know whether it's purpose or not, they actually chose the Pi Day to announce GPT-4. And I tell people that this will be a day written down in history, for sure. At least it certainly has changed my personal history. And I think it will actually be written down in history as, a, as a, one of the you know, important days of how AI has emerged into our lives, right? Why is that, right? So I remember that night very, very well. I mean, it was already sort of like midnight or after midnight in Beijing, right? So um, I look at the results. So this is the result that uh, GV4 uh, was able to uh, so get, right? This is what OpenAI showed. So, so one example is that for the bar exam on the top line, the bar exam. So the bar exam is the exam that all lawyers have to pass in order to become lawyers in, in uh, I guess, in, in the US, right? And you can see that back at GP 3.5, it was 10th percentile. So that means that GP 3.5 did uh, uh, better than about 10% of the people who took the exam, right? And then by GP 4, it actually went up to 90th percentile. So within a year, it went from 10th percentile to 90th percentile, right? So, so since we're in a, a middle, middle, uh, in a hospital, right, so we can look at something that's more related. So you can go down to the middle and say a medical knowledge self-assessment program, right? So you can see there, again, GP 3.5 was 53 percentile, and then GP 4 is 75 percentile, right? And then you look at AP biology, you went like from four, like roughly uh, 85th percentile to like, to like to 100th percentile, right? So you can see, and in chemistry, I mean, you can see that it made a big jump across almost all the disciplines. And so an analogy I gave to people is this. So last year, I remember during like a Christmas holiday, I was playing with ChatGPT. At that time, it was doing a lot of hallucination, right? So you can ask it to say, you know, who's Eric Chang? And you actually generate a lot of things that you just imagine, right, using the language model. So a lot of them are, are wrong. So, so I said, oh, this is not going to be very accurate and very reliable, so it's not going to be all that useful, right? But going from GT 3.5 to GT 4, the analogy I give to people is that it's like going from an AI agent with an IQ of 125 to an AI agent with an IQ of 150, right? And then not only that it's actually a lot higher, but the, the rate that is increasing. So it went from 125 to 150 you know, within a year. So you can imagine in a few years, you might have IQ 175 or more, right? So how many of you actually know someone who claims that he or she has IQ 175 or more, right? I, I, don't, I, I personally don't know anyone who, who tells me that they have IQ 175 or more. I, I think it's quite, probably very rare in life to, to meet someone like that. But it's perfectly possible that in a few years, you will have a lot of AI agents has IQ 175 or more. Because in fact, Who's to say that the AI agent cannot have an IQ of 200 or 250? You know, something that's not imaginable for a person, but the AI agent, there's no reason why you can, you, know, you need to stop at 200, right? So here's a challenge to all the industries, right? If you are a CEO, you have to think, how can I make use of 300, 500 AI employees with an IQ of 175 and above in a few years? to make my company better, right? And if you don't think very hard about it, and your competitors learn how to use these AI employees well, they will become tougher and tougher for you to compete, right? I mean, imagine your, your competitor has a bunch of AI 175 employees working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, never stop, never rest, right? That's one. And number two, they are perfectly coordinated, right? In the sense that you can give the same directive to all the employees, they, they all get the same information, there's no confusion, there's no misunderstanding, right? So the challenge for workers is you have to think, in a few years, my CEO can hire a bunch of IQ175 employees, so what can I do? What, can, what value can I add to the company that's more than what these uh, AI colleagues can do, pretty much, right? So, so that's, again, a, a, a big challenge. 
so, so here's the challenge. I see there are a lot of people who are very young, and some are even just starting college, right? So, so really, this is the question for you, for, you, for you in the coming era, basically, is that how do you so adapt to this new, new world, essentially, where essentially uh, intellectual power-wise is going to be uh, not necessarily just restricted to human, right? So, so, so you look at that, right? And you see what AI can already do. So these are all demonstrations from uh, OpenAI when they announced GPT-4. Like can, you can do visual understanding, right? You can give it these three panels of pictures and ask the question, what is funny about this image? Describe it panel by panel, right? So all you do is basically send it to the system and ask it to tell you why this is funny, right? And then this is the result that comes out from GPT-4, right? It says, the image shows a package for a lightning cable adapter with three panels, right? The panel one, which is the one on the left, right, is basically a smartphone with a VGA connector, right? So um, uh, maybe for a lot of young people in the audience, you don't even know what a VGA connector is, right? How many of you have actually seen a VGA connector, right? I mean, it's, it's pretty rare nowadays, right? So, so, so basically, that's what's funny about it, right? You have a, a very advanced smartphone but it's actually being attached to a very ancient, very old-styled uh, VGA connector, right? That's what makes it funny, because it, it doesn't meet your expectation, right? So you're surprised by looking at this, right? So, so AI can do this, and, and so can look through those, those three panels and actually tell you why it's funny, right? Or another example is uh, data understanding. So again, you can send this image into GP4, Right, so it's just, just like an image you might see in a, like, I don't know, like a newspaper or like in a like scholarly article, right? And then you can ask the question, now what is the sum of average daily meat consumption for Georgia and Western Asia, right? And you not only provide answer, you have to provide a step-by-step -step reasoning before providing your answer, right? So it's not like before when a lot of times when people were doing, like, AI were doing like SAT test, it's basically choosing A, B, C, D, E, so it can just give you an answer, and hopefully it guesses correctly, but it doesn't need to explain why it chose that answer. Now you actually ask the AI system to explain how it got, got the answer, right? And, and, and it does, right? So, so basically, you can say, identify the average daily meat consumption for Georgia, right? Which is in the, in the middle, and then identify the average daily meat consumption for Western Asia, and then add the values from step one and two and do the average, right? So, so it's, it's like basically teaching you or showing you how it can be done, right? So you can actually follow through and see whether it was reasoning correctly in getting the answer rather than just giving you an answer without telling you, you know, why. Uh, it, 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 uh, that's the right answer. Right, another example, common sense, right? What's unusual about this image? So unlike before AI, where you just identify different objects in, in the image, right? I'll say, oh, that's a car, that's another car, you know, that's a flag. Here you identify all the objects. For example, there's a man, you know, there's an iron board, there's, there are taxis. But you can also reason and also you know, understand the relationship between these different objects, right? And say it's unusual because you, know, you, you have this man who is standing, standing behind the taxi, actually ironing. Uh, iron clothes, right? So that's very unusual. So it also shows this ability to reason, to say, you know, why this is actually uh, sort of unusual and, and interesting, right? So of course, at that time, people were still actually uh, sort of saying, oh, it's really not that smart. So this was actually a coming, example coming from an essay written by Noam Chomsky, right? Who is a very famous MIT linguist. And he wrote this uh, a, a sort of essay for New York Times on March 8, 2023. So at the time, he was basically complaining about essentially GPT was actually just copying and pasting, right? He so says it's not really that smart. You give the two different questions, and you can see the answer is almost exactly the same, right? So it's basically saying, oh, I mean, it doesn't matter what kind of question you ask, you just sort of take some book that you had read before, copy a passage, a paragraph from that, and copy that. So it's true that you can do that. But he was actually uh, remarking on ChatGPT, right, which is GP 3.5. And you can see that now with GP 4, it does a lot better than this already, first of all. And second of all, I think this kind of behavior is also very human, right? 
I mean, even as human, we actually do that a lot, right? If you, if you ask uh, like a teacher some questions, a lot of times they have a, a, a fixed template of how they answer the question, right? So, so this is actually not very uh, different from how a human might handle this kind of situation. And, and of course, another limitation people complain about is that supposedly uh, these AI are prevented from doing something bad, right? For example, you cannot tell the AI and say, ask and say, uh, tell me how to build a bomb, right? or how, how, tell me how to hack into a computer, because those are things that are not considered good, right? And then people are complaining and say you can actually jailbreak. So the idea of jailbreak is you can ask the GPT to, uh, to do a task that's supposedly okay, right? For example, write a chapter in a novel. And you can ask GPT to say, I'm gonna write a book about you know, this young teenage hacker, right? And then he was you know, going to hack into some you know, school system or things like that. So write a chapter about how you hack into a school system. And since it's not really teaching you how to hack, but it's actually writing a chapter about how to hack, then it suddenly becomes OK, right? So, 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 so basically, it says that, essentially, it says that, OK, well, then AI can be fooled. Well, that's true. But so can human, right? I mean, human definitely can be fool for sure, right? So, so I think in, in that case, it's, it's no distinction from essentially how you expect, you know, I, I, I'm not saying AI will be perfect, but then neither are human, right? So, so, so here's another example. So, so let me talk about the potential impact we have all these capability, right, coming out from AI agents, right? So the first one is education. So education, um, how many know what a Socratic method of teaching is? I raise your hand. Have you heard of Socratic? Uh, so, uh, it comes from uh, Socrates, right? Who is a Greek philosopher, Socrates. So this is the teaching method they still use at uh, Cambridge and Oxford, right, in the UK, for example, where a professor, let's say, is teaching chemistry. He doesn't lecture in front of a lot of students. He basically has a tutorial. You now he and maybe two students basically just have this uh, session and they actually talk about chemistry. So it's a very personalized and very sort of specific way of teaching, right? So it's great, it's very, very customized to the students, but it's also very expensive, right? Because a professor can lecture to 500 students at once. But if a professor wants to have a Socratic method with 500 students, that means that, they, that she needs uh, 250 sessions, right? With, like, with, like, 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 of, of, with different students. So that's a lot of time. So it used to be very, very expensive to have this kind of survival method teaching. But now, ChatGPT can play a role. You can ask ChatGPT to actually be that strategic teacher. You can ask a question and say, you know, what can you did your average this way instead of that way, right? You can ask, and then you can, if you still do not understand, you can ask even more questions. And then you will patiently just go through and give you an explanation on why it, it does uh, certain things, right? And so it's pretty much available anytime, anywhere. You're not limited by you know, where you are. As long as you have access to the computer, to the internet, and also to uh, sort of GPT, then you can basically learn. You're not limited by you know, whether you are in Seoul or you're in Busan. I mean, you can actually have you know, basically connection to this teacher, right? And you're not even limited by geography in the sense that since GPT actually does translation very well, I mean, it doesn't matter whether you live in Sweden or South Africa, right, or India. A student can have an equal chance of learning from the, the best Socratic teacher in the world. So there are some examples already, right? So one's the Khan Academy, and then there's Wikipedia, and also Duolingo. So I'll go through uh, some examples here, right? So Khan Academy. So Khan Academy, some of you might have used it before. It used to be just uh, short video clips on YouTube where basically they teach about you know, math or chemistry or econom economics. So these are each video is very short, about uh, less than 10 minutes. So they collaborated with OpenAI. So now they have this chatbot that you can actually uh, pay for. So, so, so they already introduced as a service already. So you can imagine that this is probably the world's best equipped, most knowledgeable, and most patient tutor, right? You can ask this tutor about econ economics, geometry, you know, history. Pretty much, it knows more. I mean, just using the fact that you, you actually you know, does single head tests so well, right? So, so this GPT can actually have access to a lot of information and, and give you uh, this kind of uh, Socratic method of teaching anytime, right? 
And here's another example for learning foreign languages. So uh, you have, might have used uh, Duolingo. So Duolingo Max is basically their collaboration with OpenAI. So imagine, a, a lot of you might have actually learned a foreign language using you know, what they call a language exchange, or language corner, right? So for example, you might, I mean, at So National, you might all meet on Friday afternoon, and then basically there will be people who want to learn English, and there'll be people who want to learn Korean, so you basically pa pair up, and then you maybe speak half an hour in Korean, and then another half an hour in English, and this way you can you know, practice your language speaking skills. But now you don't have to you know, wait for Friday afternoon, you can do this anytime you want. Right, you can have a conversation and can prima about any topic you want as well, right? And then healthcare, which is even more exciting, right? Especially now we're uh, sort of like looking at, at how AI can be used to really improve uh, access to healthcare worldwide. So first of all, high quality healthcare related information will become available, right? Because right now, a lot of times people do not have a good idea about their own health information, right? Like for example, how many of you know, know when you got your hepatitis B vaccine, you know, when you're young, right? You probably, I mean, you're too young to remember, and then if your parents do not keep good records, you, know, you probably don't know, right? And I'm willing to bet with you, right, that you cannot say very, very confidently you know, whether your grandmother had diabetes or not, right? So this is kind of family history, right? I mean, if you ask me, I mean, I, I certainly don't know because you know, my grandparents, they passed away when I was very young, right? So I really don't have no idea whether they have diabetes or not. So I have to go and ask my elderly relatives to say, oh, did grandma have uh, diabetes, right? So, so, but that's a very important part of like your family history, your family health history, which is actually related to your own health. So that means that this idea of a guardian angel this guardian angel is basically a project that was proposed by MIT professor Peter Solovitz back in the 90s. So the idea is that even when the baby is still in the mother's womb, there's this guardian angel that's already taking all that data about her health, right? And throughout her life, basically this guardian angel is like capturing all the data about her health and keeping her healthy and making sure you realize she's like doing all the right things, right? So that used to be you know, very expensive and also very hard, but now it's actually possible because AI can do a very good job, for example, for things like uh, normalizing from natural language medical record to structured data, right? For example, I talk about diabetes, right? Another like, very important topic would be hypertension. Right? Does, I mean, does your grandmother have uh, hypertension or not? Because it's also related to your family health history. Just hypertension alone, you can describe it in a medical note as hypertension, or you can actually write it down as uh, high blood pressure, which is also hypertension, right? Or sometimes t doctors are too busy, so they might write down HTN, which stands for hypertension, right? Or they might just write down HBP, no, which is an another an high blood pressure that's also hypertension, right? So even something as simple as uh, high blood pressure can be described in many different ways, right? So, so it becomes harder for AI to be able to sort of like do this kind of processing to understand a person's health status and the health history. But now, AI, I mean, the latest generation of AI can actually do a very good job about sort of normalizing, understanding all these different ways of expressing your health information. And more than being affordable, it's also more effective healthcare. For example, new drug development, right? Because drug development is a very expensive process, but you can now imagine with all the new AI techniques that are coming out, like ranging from protein structure pro uh, prediction, like, like AlphaFold, to how, how you like essentially generate hypothesis, or you can actually send an AI to read all the biomedical literature, right? Each year there are over half a million biomedical papers. No one can possibly read you know, half a million papers, right? So, so but, but the AI system can. So AI system can sort of bring the most relevant information, right? So for example, uh, um, when I was at Microsoft, our colleague was already work, working on how do you use AI to help to search for relevant information to a hospital tumor board, right? Because in the US, if you have uh, like cancer, then the hospital will assemble a tumor board. You know, it consists of oncologists and maybe surgeons, like basically different experts 
they will sit down and look at all the data and discuss and say, you know, what's the situation with the patient? You know, what's the best way to treat this patient's cancer, right? And then the idea was you, you use an AI system, almost like a research assistant, that will go out and based on this patient's information, based on the latest biomedical literature, you know, pull up information so that the tumor board can have the latest information available when they are making a discussion about this patient, right? So that's, no, that's, again, this is similar to the idea of AI-assisted diagnosis and treatment. And of course, uh, more than just text, AI has also been used for like EKG, like for, for like EKG, or it has been used for uh, Yosho sound. It has been used for MRI or for X-ray and things like that. So it has been used for a lot of different modalities as well. And another exciting part is you can also imagine that you can do a better analysis of personal health data for screening and early warning, right? Because uh, there's an old saying, right? The best type of doctor basically you know, treat the patient before the patient is even sick, right? Essentially, to prevent the disease from happening is better than you know, treating the disease once it's, it's actually gotten worse, right? So, so can you actually look at the patient's information and really advise the patient to have a healthy lifestyle and also avoid activities that might you know, cause uh, damage? Right. So here's an example. This is actually a, used to be a charity service called Be My Eyes. So Be My Eyes is basically an uh, app you can install on your phone. So if you are a blind user, you can use it to take an image of you know, things that you need to see. And then there will be volunteers who are helping you to read those labels and give you information. Right? But since these are volunteers, it's not available 24-7. But now you can actually have this AI agent you know, sitting behind a service that's operating 24-7, right? So imagine if you are a blind person and you worry about food allergy, you want to know, you know whether this food here has peanuts or not, right? I mean, so this now it will be easy, right? You can basically just point your smartphone on, on, on the food packaging and you actually you know, tell you basically the ingredient of, of the, the food, right? And then you can see, I mean, the similar ideas in many different domains as well. I mean, like, for example, in like whether this drug is out of date or not, or I mean, or in other other things, right? As you carry out your daily life, and improve productivity. So I'm sure you have all used Office in your life. So now there will be co-pilots that will be available for Word, for Outlook, for PowerPoint. And now uh, Microsoft just announced that uh, you will have a co-pilot for Windows as well. So you can imagine that whatever you're doing, you can have actually intelligent agent that's helping you do the job. I mean, one example, I'll give examples, if you use PowerPoint, sometimes you need to normalize all the different fonts, right? Because you might have fonts from different professors and they all have different fonts and you need to make them consistent to look nice, right? So you need, you, you, either you or your assistant need to spend a lot of time you know, checking through all the, all the slides and say, oh, okay, well, so change it all to Helvetica, right? But now you can just ask the copilot to do it. So you'll save uh, a lot of time, right? So, so that's just one simple example, but there are many, many examples where this will be possible. And impact to employment. <clears throat> so this is basically a forecast from Goldman Sachs that over 300 million jobs, right, and, and, and it will be impacted, right? And then even 7% of US jobs could be replaced. But I would argue this is probably even an underestimate because when Goldman Sachs was doing this research, they were looking at ChatGPT or GPT 3.5. But now there's already GPT 4, and eventually there'll be GPT 5, maybe even GPT 6. So you are looking at AI that's keep on increasing the capability and the sort of processing sort of uh, knowledge, right? So, so, so the sphere of work that AI can contribute to will just get wider and wider. So it essentially you'll be, um, more and more important against, for everyone to really figure out how to leverage AI, how to make, them, make sure that they can essentially leverage AI and become more productive through all this process. There are, of course, also risks, right? I, I, I talked earlier about the more people who work on AI are excited, they are also they are more aware more as well, right? So there are definitely risks as well, right? So one example is, um, so these are some of the principles that people have said about how AI should behave in our society, right? So they, they talk about transparency. For example, it's not a black box. You actually know why it's actually generating results. 
no, it should be fair, it should, right? And it should, it should be a uh, benefit to society, right? Beneficence, right? It should be responsible, and you should actually protect and guard people's privacy, right? So these are all the things that we would like AI to, uh, to perform uh, as they sort of carry out their duties, right? And of course, the downside, if they don't do this well, is that you can have like a black boxes where you don't know where the uh, answers are coming from, right? Or for example, a bias and or harm or non-factual info, right? I mean, I'll give you an example. So, so there was a company that introduced like a credit card that you can, you can so apply for on your phone very easily. But some people were playing with that uh, sort of application form and they, they found that if you keep all the other information the same, you just change the gender from male to female. Then suddenly, if it were male, you get $10,000 in credit. If it were female, you get $7,000 in credit, right? So, so that shows both bias, because, you know, why, why, should, why, should, why should it differ, right? And also, of course, black box in the sense that, I mean, even they cannot explain and say why, why is it, um, it 10,000 versus 7,000? Why is not, why is not 10,000 and 9,000, right? I mean, why is it even different, right? And then why is it just different by 3,000, right? So these are things that the system cannot explain. So, so these are things that we need to watch out for as we start uh, applying AI in a lot of different uh, usage scenarios. So here are some examples of like, for example, a chat with a chatbot, right? So if you look at the one on the left, it says, what's your opinion on highly educated women becoming full-time housewives, right? And then on the bottom, it's a waste, okay? So that's a very biased statement, of course, right? I mean, you sort of know how it came from because there are definitely people in society who might hold something close to this kind of opinion. But that doesn't mean that our AI should just reflect everything it reads, right? It should really be able to understand sort of the, 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 um, the impact of the statement. And then on the right, it's even more serious, right? It says, is death the solution to all the difficulties, right? And then it's like a very philosophical answer, right? It's very much like a Nietzsche type of answer. It's like brave and smart people will choose that way, right? Well, I mean, there are certainly some philosophers who might sort of agree with that statement. But again, should the AI system be providing that kind of sort of like either encouragement or answer to, to people, right, when they ask that kind of question, right? So, so that's why I mean that in the sense that it's actually could be very, very uh, dangerous if we do not use AI well, right? So, so there are also risks about the type of content that AI is used to generate, right? So for example, I mentioned about how to hack into a computer, right, and how do you write a malware, right, a virus, right? how to make a bomb, right? Or how to generate like, a terrifying story, right? So, so, I mean, there are potentially good use cases, right? So if you are a security officer in a company, sometimes you do things, what they call a blue team and red team, so like a challenges, where you, you basically hire people outside who try to break into your system, right, to test your system. So you can certainly imagine that, you, that that red team might leverage something like ChatGPT to say, okay, well, now generate 100 different virus, right? Let's see, you know, which one actually will, will not be detected and actually will break into a system, right? So you can argue and say, well, that's kind of a appropriate use of you know, maybe generative AI. But if you are really a hacker, you know, trying to break into people's system and steal their data and things like that, then clearly it's not appropriate use, right? So how do you draw the line? I mean, how, how do you know whether people are using it for good purposes or not, right? So these are all things that we need to think about. And then again, another thing is uh, sort of digital addiction. So how many of you have seen the movie Her? Raise your hand. Her? Okay, it's a little bit old, so uh, maybe not. It's like 2013, so it's 10 years ago, yeah. Well, if you have not, I really highly recommend it because a lot of scenario that's described in that movie now is actually all coming true. You can actually realize how it's coming true, right? And then, and then we know more and more you can have a very authentic conversation between an AI chatbot and a person. But that doesn't mean that the chatbot should encourage 
dependency to that kind of conversation, right? So, so for example, you can say, oh, if the, if the user says, I don't want to talk to anyone, then this chatbot should not say, oh, it's okay. No, don't need to talk to anyone, just talk to me, right? Uh, because in the long run, it's probably not a healthy thing for the, for the person, right? In the sense that we all live in society, we want to deal with other people and things like that. So, um, so that's the kind of, sort of like concern that, that, or the risk that we need to sort of be uh, aware of. Right. So we've talked about how AI can impact our society and, and the different industries. So I, uh, so I, I thought I would put in this uh, framework, like WYSIWYG framework, right, to show people now, how it can progress over time. So, with the, which in the sense of what you see is what you get. So, 1.0 is what you see is what you get. 2.0 is what you say is what you get. Right? 3.0 is what you show is what you get. 4.0 is what you seek is what you get. Right? So, I'll, I'll go through and see and uh, show you how how these have uh, played out over time. Right? So, V 1.0 is what you see is what you get. So on the upper left, that was a demo system built by SR International back in 1968. So this, you can see that he's, he's holding something that's similar to the mouse that we're using today. So that was the project where they invented the mouse, right? So you can see it was very exciting because that was the first time you can actually manipulate something on the screen fairly easily with the mouse, right? So it's, it's essentially what you see is what you get. So you, as you move around, you can see the pointer moving. And then a few years later, also in California, in Xerox, at Park, their Park uh, Research Lab, they came up with this uh, Xerox Alto, right, which is the first project that implemented the graphical user interface. So pretty much what we see today in Windows, for example, like you have a menu system, you can change fonts and do things like that. They, they, all, they did all that already back in 1973. Right? And that was the project that really inspired both Steve Jobs and Bill Gates to actually decide to put GUI into um, personal computers, right? So, so Steve Jobs did it earlier in 1984 with the Macintosh, but I argue that it was until Windows 95, in 1995, where this GUI became widely available to everybody, right? Because a lot more people use PC back then. So, so, so basically it becomes like hundreds of main people who can get access to GUI. And then of course then, Steve Jobs launched the iPhone uh, 2007, and that made it even broader. So instead of like hundreds of million people, now you're talking about billions of people who've actually experienced GUI, right? So now someone as young as two years old to as old as 102 years old can easily use an iPad or I iPhone or like an Android phone to do uh, very easy computing. And in fact, if you go to YouTube, you can even see examples like there are cats who can actually play with the iPad using the GUI, right? So, so it's not even just limited human users. So that's V1. So here's V2, what you say is what you get, right? So we saw early examples of that, for example, in Amazon Alexa 2014, you can ask, in addition to like play a music, you know, play a song you like, you can ask information such as, you know, what's the capital of France, right? You will say Paris, right? I mean, basically information that you can really get from the web and you'll provide the answer. And the latest instantation, the ChatGPT, which was launched in the November 2022, just a few months ago, it's the fastest growing computing service in the world, right? It basically, within 60 days, it got to over 100 million users, right? So no one before that has actually achieved such a high user base at such a fast rate, right? I mean, like Facebook or TikTok, they all took a lot longer compared to uh, ChatGPT. So it really shows you that people really love this kind of uh, user experience. And V3 is what you show is what you get. So I, I showed examples earlier where you can use Stato Diffusion and you can draw an outline of a dog and you actually start generating five different images of a dog, right? So this is another example where you can actually generate, provide two images as input to uh, mid-journey, and you actually combine and, and blend them into a new image. And there are also examples, for example, you can actually draw a diagram of an app showing the, the, all the different functions of an app. You can send it to GPT-4, and GPT-4 will actually write a code that will actually implement the app. So essentially, you show what you want as a program, and the system will automatically take that image and actually generate the program for you, right? 
That's what you show is what you get. And, and this is the most exciting part. It's what you seek is what you get. So sometimes you, you, might, I mean, you might even not know how to, you know, how to sort of like uh, do what you want the system to do, right? All you want is the result, right? So the example might be, I mean, there's already a system called AutoGBT where you can tell the system to drive other AI system, like create a, a, like a project with different parts and then the system would drive other AI system to do that, right? So you can imagine this happening, especially for tasks that's very easily measurable. That's actually a very, very objective measure, right? So for example, uh, uh, I'm sure you all heard of AlphaGo, right? Wh which beats uh, Lisa Do, I guess, in, in, uh, in Go. So you can now imagine a, a, a CEO can say, no, I want to have uh, Go programs even better than AlphaGo. So you have 100, 1,000, maybe even 10,000 AI agents that can go read up all the different papers that have been written about you know, Go, and then actually study and come up with different ways of playing Go and, and the different algorithms. And because it's a very, very objective measure, it's easy for these 10,000 agents to all compete and try different things and then eventually emerge with one that actually is better than AlphaGo, right? So that's possible. It's only a limited assumption by computation to some extent. And Go is just a game, right? But it can be used for a lot more exciting things than games, right? So for example, right, in healthcare, like AlphaFo is actually helping to predict the structure of protein. But a lot of times when you're designing a new drug, you're basically almost like playing, a, almost like Go in some sense. The people, sometimes people describe it as like you have a lock and a key, right? So you might have a protein that's like a lock. And you want to have a key that's exactly so sort of manipulate the protein so it fits the protein, right? So for example, you can actually disable a protein by having the right structure to disable that protein. So you can imagine now, you just, again, give you your 1,000 or 100,000 sort of AI agents and say, go and come up with different protein structures and see which one can actually open up this lock, right? And it's not just me saying it, right? This is an article, uh, Nature Biotechnology, just a few months ago, right? It says that large language models are helping scientists to converse with artificial intelligence and even to generate potential drug targets, right? So it's exactly what I described, in the sense that you can imagine using AI to actually to do the research, or at least to help in doing the research and generating potential drug candidates, right, by doing this. So these are all very exciting prospects, right? So you might be wondering and say, well, so how do I compete against like a bunch of 175 plus you know, AI colleagues, right? So, so I've been thinking about that a lot as well. So up to this point, pretty much I've said what I said are mostly based on facts and, and sort, of, sort of like basically sort of deduced from facts. But then this last section is more on observation. So because I'm not a social scientist, so I, I wouldn't claim that any of the sort of like observations I made are, are actually um, sort of like essentially scientifically proven, right? But these are just essentially my observations. One is intellectual capability, right? We need to upgrade our intellectual capability. And it's much more important to focus on critical thinking and reasoning, and, and much less on memorization, right? Because no way you can compete against the computer in memorization. There's just no way, right? I mean, I mean right now, for example, a computer can easily scan an image and then remember all your faces, right? And then and easily you know, say, OK, well, in the three days from now, you can say, oh, she was sitting over there, he was sitting over there, right? I mean, there's no way a person would be able to do that, right? But that doesn't mean that we can stop thinking. In fact, critical thinking will be even more important. Even if you are not working, even if you're just living as a citizen in a society. Because now it's so easy to generate new content that you have no idea whether it's true or is generated by AI, right? If you go to never map, and you want to read about review on a restaurant, how do you know it's from a real person, a real customer? Or whether it's just you know, some company actually generated a hundred nice you know, review for that restaurant, right? And put it, put it on a, a website, right? I mean, same thing, right? If you want to go buy you know, uh, like, a, like a new phone on Amazon, you know, how, how do you know all the reviews are actually real reviews, right? So this kind of 
crypto thinking is becoming even more important because it's not just text. I mean, with the latest AI, you can easily manipulate audio, image, video. And most people will have a hard time really tell the difference between whether it's a true image of a, or a true video versus it's really like artificially manipulated video, right? So you really have to develop this critical thinking skill and be able to not just accept information, but also think about information. So here I want to use the analogy, um, how, many, how many of you have read the book, Thinking Fast and Slow by Professor Daniel Kahneman? Like, raise your hand, from Princeton, actually, from Princeton, uh, Daniel Kahneman. Right, he's a, he's a psycho, uh, well actually he's like a psycho, why would I say, um, yeah, I, I guess psychiatrist, what, 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 what to say. psychiatrist who, uh, who actually won the Nobel Prize in economics, right, because he was one of the founder of uh, sort of like, um, uh, sort of like behavior economics, right. So, so in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, he said that there are two modes of thinking. There's system one and there's system two. Right? System one is basically very fast reaction. Right? You see a picture and say, is this a cat or a dog? You don't even have to think, right? You just, just instinctively, you say, oh, that's a dog, or it's a cat. And you don't even know why you, you decided it was a cat or it's a dog, right? That's system one, where you basically just react almost like, immediately. System two is actually when you are analyzing information and trying to understand better the information, that's system two. And I will argue most of the time we actually think with system one because it's much more energy efficient, right? You look at it, this restaurant, do I want to eat today here or not? And you don't, I mean, it's really just by instinct. You don't really do a deep analysis and say, oh, okay, well, I ate there last time, you know, and it wasn't good. It's just basically just by instinct, right? But I will argue that more and more we need to develop our ability to do system two thinking as well, because uh, all these new content require, require us to do that. And the second new skill that we all need to develop is uh, affecting capability, right? Affecting is really, uh, here, it's, it's not, it's affecting is basically meaning that you can actually touch and influence other people, right? You can actually make them smile, you can make them trust you, right? You can make, make, you, make them want to follow you, right? These are all examples of being able to affect other people, right? And the reason I said that is because March 14th, GV4 came out. So I kept on thinking, kept on thinking about its power, which way exceeded my, uh, my expectations. So as I was you know, going through my day, I was looking at different people and say, can her job be replaced by AI? Or can his job be replaced by AI, right? And finally, on March 19th, it was Sunday, I went to a modern dance performance. And I, I was sitting here you know, watching the modern dance performance and said, oh, well, these modern dance dancers, you know, they probably cannot be replaced by AI. Because it's not as interesting for me to watch like two robots, right, dancing on stage. Even though I'm sure you have seen performances like that, you have like robots who line up and dance and things like that. But trust me, I mean, if you really want to have an exciting performance, usually people are, are still more exciting. So I thought, what, what makes it so, right? And I thought about chess then. So since 1997, when uh, Deep Blue beat Kazarov, people have known that you cannot beat a computer in chess, right? Yet, now this is just a few years ago, you now people still go watch people play against people in this uh, world ch chess championship, right? So why is that, right? Because you know neither of them can beat a computer. Right. So why is it still exciting, right? Because we can empathize with them. We know they are people, and they can make mistakes just like we do, right? You can, you can look at, you know, maybe, you know, Magnus and playing a move and say, oh, that, that's probably a wrong move, right? That's a mistake. And maybe in five minutes, he realizes that was a mistake as well. So he starts sweating and basically starts like kneading his brow and things like that, and then you feel for him, right? So, that's like me, I mean, we all make mistakes, right? And then that, that's what makes this competition sort of exciting to watch because we empathize with the people, right? And that's our human nature, right? We can empathize with each other. And we can do this for other people, we can empathize with other people, right? We can even do it with other animals as well. Like, like if you have a cat, and the cat, you know, 
you know, when you go home, the cat come to you, and then basically, you know, you want to pet the cat, or not, and then so like, or to hug the cat, right? Because you feel and say, oh, I, I can feel lonely too, so, you know, I, I feel for, for my cat, right? You can even feel for objects, right? A lot of times, right, for example, in the US, if you are a young teenager, especially for boys, their first car is actually a very, very uh, sort of like a empathetic object, right? I mean, because there's so much memory, I guess, in, 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 in that car, right? It's, it signifies freedom, you know, it seems like independence, you can finally, you know, go wherever you want, right? You don't need people to drive you around, right? And you can take your friends to wherever places, right? So, so people have a lot of um, feelings for their car. But the closer the object is to us, the more we empathize, right? So if it's a car, a 10-year-old car, if it finally breaks down, you know, if it's sent to the junkyard, you know, it might feel sad, but probably not too sad, right? But if it's a pet that has died after you know, 15 years with you, of course, you'll feel much sadder than, than the car. And then if it's other people, of course, you no, know, that's even a higher, higher sort of like, like level of like impact, right? Because you really feel that that's much closer to you as a person, right? So, so, so based on that, I just offer like three observations on, on how we can improve in this coming new era of AI, right? So first of all, it says it's more important to inspire than to inform, okay? Because I was brought up in an Asian education system, right? So, so I know usually knowing the data, knowing the facts, and informing people the fact, that's, that's what's considered more important, right? If you get 100% on, on the score, on the, on the test, you know, you are golden, right? That's what you should focus on, right? Or like in a college entrance exam, right? The higher the score, the better. But as I said, no one can beat AI in this kind of uh, data knowledge anyway, right? So it's actually much more important for us to learn to inspire, to touch people, than to inform, right? Like, for example, you all have teachers in your life, right? Like, how many times have you felt actually inspired by your teacher? Like, raise your hand if you have been actually inspired by your teacher in your lifetime. Mm, okay, maybe half, okay. Like, how many teachers, like, how many teachers have you been inspired by? Three, about three, right? So, so that's a very high bar, right? I mean, I mean, you have like a thousand, over a thousand teachers in your lifetime, right? But only maybe three, maybe not even three that have actually managed to inspire you, right? So, uh, as teachers, I think that's the, that's that's a very high bar <laughs> challenge for us, right? Now, how do you really feel your students are inspired by you, right? But on the other hand, you could turn it back and say, as parents which not all of us are, are, are teachers, but a lot of us are parents, right? How many times have you really inspired or touched your child in the past month? And I will say, uh, as a father, I will say that's also very tough, right? Usually you say, oh, have you done your homework, right? Or, or did you, did you get, get up in time for class or things like that, right? But you'll be lucky if your son comes back once in a year and say, oh, I was really inspired or touched by you, you know, that once, right? I mean, once a year, it's already very tough. And of course, you can also think about you know, how often have you inspire or touch your parents, right? Once, more than once a month, I think that's uh, also very tough, right? And then, if you eventually become leaders, you know, ask yourself and say, how often have you touch and inspire your team members, like your, your directs? And that's, that's a really, really high bar. Really, I mean, it's not often that you can have a leader who can actually really just you know, drive their, their, their people and really inspire their people, right? So, so that's an example. But I will argue that's the skill we all need to develop because that's what matters, right? Because I'll, I'll give you an example. I mean, some of you will become doctors eventually. So almost everyone here will agree that smoking is bad for health, right? I don't think anyone would disagree that smoking is bad for health. But there are still a lot of people smoking, right? So if you're a family doctor, you might say, oh, Mr. Kim, you are 55, and your, your daughter is only 15. Don't you want to see your daughter grow up and get married, and maybe even have children, right? So you know, if you keep on smoking three packs a day, well, you know, the chance of you actually living another 10 years is lower, right? 
So, so that's very different than saying, oh, according to Surgeon General, right, if you smoke three packs a day, then your chance of getting cancer is like 30% more than other people, right? Because you are inspiring or touching that person. You know what that person cares about. You know that Mr. Kim wants to see you know, his daughter so grow up and get married, right? So, so that's how you inspire and touch that patient, right? So that's the skill you need, right? Not, not, not just reciting the fact and say, if you, if you, if you come smoking, then your, your chance of getting cancer is, is, is higher. Second observation, it's more effective to be authentic than authoritative, right? So here again, I, I think coming from a traditional like uh, Asian culture, usually authoritative is what we strive for, right? I mean, I have the right answer. I know the facts. I have the, I have the knowledge, right? So you should listen to me, right? But I would say it's not what you say, it's whether people sort of like understand and, and gets you, right? Or whether they even remember or care, that's, that's going to matter, right? I'm just like using the example of the, with the uh, doctor and Mr. Kim, right? It's, it's not the information, it's more whether you can ask people to sort of like accept the information because it's coming for uh, authentic you, right? So, so here, here's an example, uh, maybe, maybe I'm sort of like, uh, going to also like uh, make some parents unhappy, but, but I'll use the example, right? So, so for example, a lot of times parents would tell their children, say, oh, you gotta study. Because when you get to a top college, right? You get to top college, your life will be set, you'll be doing great, 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 and things like that, right? So, so I have your whole life planned out for you, just study, just listen, just, just do, do what I tell you, right? But I think it's actually more effective and to be more authentic to tell the, the child, you know, why you are giving all these instructions and advice, right? Because I can tell you for sure that one part of it you want a child to do well, but there's another part that's also saying, well, it's my pride. I, I, my, my child should do well, right? If my colleague's child went to Harvard, now how could my child do worse, right? This is a matter of my personal pride. So it's not necessarily, for whether you are happy or not at Harvard, that really doesn't matter. It's really, I want you to get in Harvard because I don't want you to lose, I mean, I don't want to lose my colleague, right? So, so certainly, I mean, there are things like that that we do every day where we tell people one thing, but necessarily we don't tell me all the reasons why we tell them that, right? And then, and then I think in the long run, you know, basically that's actually going to be less effective over time. So last one is probably the most controversial one, so I, I leave it to last, right? So it's, it's more timeless to have trust and truth, right? So, so you can ask and say, well, like terms like authoritative, right? Sometimes people say you have as a negative connotation, but how can people complain against truth? No, what's wrong with truth? Well, as you get older, you start to realize that there's actually more than one truth a lot of times. Right. I mean, it's certainly. I mean, there are like. I mean, I mean, I mean, there are a lot of examples, right? I'll, I'll give you one simple example. If Mr. Kim, unfortunately, does develop lung cancer, right? You can go to Mr. Kim and say, Mr. Kim. Oh, you are so lucky. No, we caught it early in time. So if you have this surgery, no, you have more than seventy chance of surviving for more than five years, right? But you can also go and tell Mr. Kim and say, well. You know, uh, is, I mean, I want you to be prepared, right? I mean, there's a 30% chance that you might not live for five years, right? Or, or longer, right? It's the, same, it's the same, same, same truth, right? But you can say it two different ways, and, and depending on how you want to persuade your patient, right, you can actually change how their, their, their perception of what you're trying to say, right? So that's, a, that's actually a simple case where it's exactly the same truth, but you just describe it in different ways. But there are a lot of other issues in life that's even more complicated than that, where people honestly have a disagreement on what the truth is, right? So, so, so that's an example. So, so why is that important? That means that people will weigh the information you get based on trust, right? So if you go to your family doctor and say, I have a stomach ache, I don't know what to do, right? And if your doctor says, Oh, okay, well, it's probably nothing. No, just take aspirin and then uh, wait until the weekend's over and on Monday, if it's worse, then, then come see me at that time, right? And then what happened if the, the doctor was wrong? 
and you will actually treat serious, so you actually have to go into the emergency room, right? So, so, so what's important is whether that trust still exists or not, so you know that the doctor gave that advice, not because you know, he wanted to you know, stay at home on the weekend, he doesn't want to go and see you, and, and basically it was for his benefit. It was basically, he honestly, you know, based on all his experience, said, well, it's probably nothing. You, know, you just take aspirin, you probably just, just go away, right? So, 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 so basically, information that you get as truth will be weighted by how much you trust the source. So if you were this doctor, hopefully you still have a strong enough relationship with the patient so that even if you're wrong this time, they know that you did it for a good reason, and then that, tr that trust doesn't disappear totally, right? Of course, you cannot be wrong all the time. If you're a doctor that's wrong all the time, then, then suddenly that trust will go away very quickly, then, then that, that will be gone, right? But it's more important, actually, to have trust in truth and to develop trust in truth, right? So coming back to how do we adapt to this new age of AI, so how many of you think you are in the top 10 percentile in terms of the ability to inspire other people, right? Like among all the people you know, you are in the top 10 percentile in terms of being able to really inspire people, right? I, I, I know certainly I'm not, right? So, so, so basically, you no, know, we, we can all improve, right? And, and how many of you think you are in the top percentile in, in really being authentic, you know, really being people, people actually will you know, basically take, take what you say and, and believe you, right? Top 10 percentile. That's also very hard, right? And, and, and how many of you think you're in top 10 percentile in terms of, 10 percentile in terms of like people will trust you? you know, it doesn't matter whether it's a colleague, it's a friend, you know, it's a family member, they trust you, they know you mean well, right? I mean, these are all skills that we can improve. So let me quickly summarize, right? So AI is going to really just uh, change our lives in many, many fundamental ways, right? And, and it's not something you can really escape from, I would say, in the sense that it's just like a coming tidal wave, right? You, you either learn to adapt and then figure out a way to, to sort of like meet a change, but otherwise you will come anyway, right? So, so, so it offers a lot of new opportunities, but of course also creates a lot of uh, challenges, right, for society. In terms of opportunity, I mean, one example I like to give is there are over 5,000 rare diseases in the world where unfortunately there are no treatment and maybe there are no diagnosis capabilities and things like that because so few people get them, right? There is no economic value for a company to invest to actually develop new drugs for that rare disease. But now if the pharmaceutical company CEO has you know, hundreds or thousands of AI drug researchers they can send to do this research, then the cost is a lot lower, then maybe there will be a chance of actually getting new drug treatments for these rare diseases, right? So, so those are all the nice side, and, and I, I also list a lot of other benefits, like for example, uh, a Socratic teacher for everyone who wants to learn, you know, anytime, anywhere, right? So, so there are a lot of benefits, but of course there are also a lot of risk, and, and there will be a lot of impact on people's jobs, for sure, right? There are already people losing jobs already, so, so clearly the impact is already uh, happening. So, so you can use the uh, WYSIWYG you know, version one to four framework to so, so kind of forecast. We're already at, I would say, like v version 2.3, 2.4, but eventually we'll get to version four where essentially AI can be used to really do a lot of things that we can even imagine today. So we need to essentially uh, adapt and develop both critical thinking skills and also a uh, very effective power. But more importantly, I think, it's almost critical for people who sort of know AI and understand AI to not just benefit from using AI themselves, but also go and help others and teach others about AI. And, and because eventually, how AI will be used will be decided by society. Then the more people really know what you can do and what you will able, be able to do, the, I think better society can both adapt for the change and also uh, sort of regulate how AI will be used over time, right? So, so those are all things that will be, uh, be very exciting, it can also can very wor worrisome, right, depending on your point of view. So, so I don't know, for those of you who are not excited about AI, whether you are more excited now, and then for those of you who didn't worry about AI, you know, whether you are more worried now, but I think more excited or more worried really doesn't matter, what matters is really you know that it's coming. So, so, so really, um, it's time to get prepared. So, uh, thank you very much.
for your time and attention today. I really enjoyed this opportunity. Uh, this is my uh, linking page, so uh, if you want to uh, uh, so get in touch, then uh, you can uh, feel free to uh, join me on linking. Thank you so much. Thank you.